All right, so now let's look at the, the Calvin cycle directly. We, we are going to consider six turns of this cycle in which we take six molecules of carbon dioxide and fix all of them into organic molecules. So let's go through this cycle first in an overview sense. We can divide it into phases, the carbon fixation phase, which as we've said occurs in the first biochemical reaction of the pathway. And then the use of ATP energy and, um, and NADPH oxidation to in the reduction phase of the Calvin cycle to produce molecules of glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. And we've seen glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. That was an intermediate in the uh, glycoly glycolytic pathway in glycolysis. This was the intermediate produced by cleavage of a six carbon compound into two three carbon compounds. And for every six for every six turns of this cycle, we will generate two molecules of glyceraldehyde three phosphate that can be converted into glucose and other sugars. So we need six turns of this cycle. We need to add six carbons coming from six carbon dioxide molecules in order to generate two molecules. Um, two molecules of three carbons each of glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate that will be then fixed in glucose. And that makes sense because if we have two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, that's two times three carbons equals six carbons. And we are using the six carbons from six molecules of carbon dioxide. That is, we need six turns of this cycle to generate our two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. It will then be converted to glucose and other sugars. Now, at this, for every, for every six turns, we will actually generate 12 molecules of glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, two of which will be incorporated into sugars, and 10 of which will continue on in the pathway for every six turns of the cycle. And here we need, uh, we need uh, ATP energy again to produce. Um, to produce ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate, that is RUBP, the molecule to which carbon will be added from carbon dioxide to form 3-phosphoglycerate in the first step of the cycle again. So the last phase of the Calvin cycle is the regeneration of RUBP, or ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate. And this, in essence, then, represents the fixation of carbon the whole goal of photosynthesis in the first place. And the required molecules are 12 ATP here, 6 ATP here, and 12 NADPHs. So we have a ratio of 1.5 ATPs used per every one NADPH used to drive this cycle, to fuel this cycle. And where do these molecules come from? Of course, they came from the light-dependent reactions using photosystems 2 and then photosystem 1. And this, these reactions are light-independent, as we've already discussed. Now we're ready to look at the relationship between cellular respiration and photosynthesis that we've covered. And this uh, picture of the Calvin cycle here actually is a good segue into that because if you'll notice glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate here, 1,3-bis-phosphoglycerate and 3-phosphoglycerate are all intermediates in the glycolytic pathway. But here glycolysis would actually run in this direction. These three compounds would be produced in glycolysis in this direction, but in photosynthesis in the, in the Calvin cycle, they are being produced in this direction. And this brings up the notion that, in fact, the biochemistry of photosynthesis and the biochemistry of cellular respiration are intimately related. And in fact, we know that photosynthesis evolved before cellular respiration did, and that it's not surprising then that evolution would seize on some of the same enzymes and the same genes that encode those enzymes to function to, um, to function in cellular respiration. So let's look at 
a few slides here now by way of review. These are text slides and you can freeze the movie and examine them as long as you'd like. And then we'll move on to the uh, relationship between photosynthesis and cellular respiration. So by way of review, And here we have our uh, schematic of the relationship between these. Notice that cellular respiration produces water, as you know, water is released in respiration, as is carbon dioxide. And these are starting compounds that are needed for photosynthesis. Likewise, photosynthesis produces oxygen and um, sugars, which glucose, which enters into the breakdown, glucose here, which enters into the breakdown for um, respiration. So if all this is occurring in a plant cell, if we imagine this is in a plant cell, we have respiration going concurrently with photosynthesis, and these two are providing each other, these two plastids in a way, are the mitochondria and the chloroplasts are providing each other with the compounds they need to, to conduct their respective biochemistries. <coughs> Excuse me. And you'll note other similarities as well. You notice that, for example, the ATP synthase found in the inner, my, inner mitochondrial membrane is evolutionarily related, closely related to the ATP synthase found in the thylakoid membrane of chloroplasts. So there are homologies, there are molecular homologies in the deep biochemistry of these two processes, and it reflects the ability of evolution to seize upon existing biochemistries to modify them for new purposes. And in animals, of course, or in cells that can't photosynthesize, they need to obtain their glucose from some other source. They can't obtain them directly in the same cell from photosynthesis. <laughs> so how do they do that? They have to eat things. They have to consume other animals or plants to obtain the glucose required for cellular respiration. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. Now we're ready to consider another feature of photosynthesis, and that is photorespiration, and that involves the Rubisco enzyme. So let's talk about that in just a moment. Photorespiration is a result of the enzyme Rubisco um, catalyzing not the first step of the Calvin cycle, but instead of oxidizing ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate. So in addition to conducting the first step of the Calvin cycle, Rubisco, the Rubisco enzyme is capable of adding oxygen to RUBP and eventually releasing, in fact, CO2. CO2 is released and RUBP is oxidized. CO2 is produced, and Rubisco is capable of conducting this biochemistry as well. And in fact, Rubisco plus oxygen uh, oxidizes RUBP and produces CO2, so actually removes uh, carbons from RUBP. So this is counter counterproductive to fixation of carbon. We're actually releasing carbon in this biochemical reaction, and the oxygen and the CO2, which are the substrates for either the first step of the Calvin cycle or alternatively this Rubisco catalyzed oxidation of RUBP releasing carbon dioxide, the carbon dioxide and oxygen actually compete for the active site for Rubisco. So under, uh, even under normal conditions, say 25 degrees centigrade, about close to a quarter, 20% of the activity of Rubisco is actually um, acts against the fixation of carbon and, in fact, oxidizes RUBP. 
So that's even under normal conditions. But under hot conditions, the situation is reversed. And let's look at why that might be true. So if we look at a leaf, for example, leaves um, have cell, the, the photosynthetic cells are under the cuticle of the leaf. And in order to conduct gas exchange, there are openings in the leaf that are, um, are, that are regulated by guard cells. And these are called stomata. Singular would be stoma. Uh, plural would be stomata. And for example, under normal, um, um, photos, uh, under normal conditions, there's gas exchange through these stomata. Oxygen is released and carbon dioxide is brought in. The wa and, but water can also leave through these stomata and can dry out the leaf. Um, so um, there's loss of water through evaporation. And so the stomata close under hot conditions. So if there are plants that have adapted a, a mechanism to close these guard cells, to constrict these guard cells around the stomatal openings. But that leads to a problem under hot conditions. When that happens, oxygen being produced by photosynthesis builds up in the leaf and carbon dioxide cannot enter the leaf. And as you know, we need carbon dioxide uh, to enter cells in order to be fixed into glucose molecules in the process of the light independent reactions of photosynthesis. So we have a buildup of oxygen and a deficit, if you will, of carbon dioxide. And from what I've just told you about photorespiration, the Rubisco enzyme under conditions of high oxygen and low carbon dioxide will favor the oxidation of RUBP and not the fixation of carbon. So um, we've got a problem here. We have photorespiration. This, this, this process is called photorespiration. So we're oxidizing RUBP by adding oxygen. And in fact, we're releasing CO2. We're doing the opposite of fixing carbon, in other words. And since CO2 and O2 are competing for the active site on, on um, Rubisco, then um, we've got a, a special problem under hot conditions because we have in the leaf, we have high concentrations now of, under hot conditions, high concentrations of oxygen, lower concentrations of carbon dioxide and that will favor the oxidation of RUBP. So plants need to, solve, uh, to find a way to, uh, to um, at least have mechanisms that will combat this photorespiration, which, is, um, which decreases photosynthetic yield significantly. So there are a se several adaptations that allow this. Um, certain plants use an enzyme other than Rubisco they, they use phosphoenopyruvate carboxylase in which, and this enzyme catalyzes the addition of carbon dioxide or carbon to phosphoenopyruvate, PEP. And a four, carbon, a four, four carbon compound is produced instead of the normal three carbon compounds that result in the first step of the Calvin cycle. And then CO2, carbon can be released from that four carbon compound later and can be used by Rubisco in the normal Calvin cycle. And these types of plants are called C4 plants. These are C4 plants because instead of producing a, a three carbon compound immediately, a four carbon compound is produced by a PEP carboxylase um, prior to the production of a three carbon compound that can be used by the Calvin cycle. So C4 plants use PEP carboxylase to capture CO2 and temporarily store it. And then the carbon, can later, the carbon dioxide can later be stripped from the four carbon compound and um, moved to uh, another cell where the CO2 is released and used in the Calvin cycle as, at normal, as a normal plant would. And that's where we'll pick up with in the next part of this lecture.